Hello and welcome to an all new episode of the Lisa Ann Experience. I am your host, Lisa Ann, and I would love to extend my gratitude to you for making me a part of your listening experience while I also go into an immediate apology about the maybe sound quality, maybe video quality. I am in a remote location. I could give you the secret now because by the time you hear this, I will be en route back. And I love to travel this way. I love when nobody knows where I am. It's a great feeling. I mean, the people that I'm visiting know where I am, but for everyone else, it's a, the strangest thing is the time zone. You wake up and you're like, huh, it's 7.30 here. It's 10.30 there. Maybe people are wondering where I am because I haven't posted yet, but I am on the West Coast and I took a really special journey so far this trip. I'm going to give you a brief recap. But next week, you're going to get the full recap because I've actually been writing a lot this trip. And so I'm writing down different things that I'd like to share in a fully developed solo episode about this experience and my perspective coming up on my 52nd birthday, Uh, the way I've lived my life, the choices that I've made, the things that I'm doing, the people that I'm surrounded by, uh, all the goodness that there is, it's very easy to forget where we've come from, how far we've come, how well we're doing. It's very easy to forget to give ourselves credit for doing well. And as I got halfway through this journey yesterday, I had just one of these beautiful aha moments. And I was like, I'm going to write this down and I'm going to journal. So I'll tell you where this trip started. I started going from New York to Santa Barbara. Uh, Santa Barbara, California, I had not ever flown into that tiny, adorable, beautiful little airport. And for me to be able to go to a new airport is kind of exciting. Because when I was first booking the trip, I was thinking I was going to fly into LAX and have to drive up to Santa Barbara. So I was kind of like, look at time and when I could do it with traffic. And then Brittany reminded me that I could just fly directly into Santa Barbara. So if you have been listening to my podcast for some time, you may remember a conversation I had with Brittany De La Mora, who I knew from her time in the industry. I was her agent for a period of time. I watched Brittany go through so many things, and now I get to see her living just a beautiful life. Her and her husband and their church, Love Always Ministries, the amount of people that they're helping. And so we kind of touch base with each other and always want to have new conversations. And from what Brittany has been doing and being a guest on a bunch of different podcasts and being a part of debates and being a part of the understanding that each time I do something with Brittany, people in the industry will come at me as if you know, because they think Brittany is anti the industry, which Brittany is not. But Brittany did not have the same experience that I had in the industry. Many people, as we are seeing now, did not have the same experience that I had in the industry. And the fact that Brittany can now use that experience to help other people come out of a situation that they don't want to be in any longer, succeed, find peace, all of these things, it's so beautiful. And because we're evolving with technology and OS, and these other platforms and more creators, there's always new conversations to be had. So Brittany had asked if I would be a guest on her podcast and if I would come out to Santa Barbara and do it in person. So she brought me out there and she put me in an absolutely gorgeous suite at the beach. Uh, And I'm right on State Street so I can be around the beauty of Santa Barbara. It was so special when I got there. She picked me up at her airport. She had already checked me into the hotel, made sure there was bottled waters and snacks. Like, just can you believe it? This is a little human being that at one point I really thought was no longer going to be with us due to drugs, due to addiction, due to being in in just bad situations. And the way our relationship has evolved, it's like it's like the pride a parent feels, but I don't have children, but I understand. There's just such a joy in seeing somebody create a better life for them. And now her and her husband have two beautiful children. So it was my first time meeting their children and getting to spend time with them. And we had a ton of fun, two days of spending time together. Yes, we did the interview, but that was such a small portion of the visit. 
Then we all went out to lunch. And then that night, Brittany and I were able to have a dinner, just the two of us. Uh, and then the next morning, we all went out and we walked the beach in Santa Barbara, which is beautiful on Sunday mornings because they have all local art and all local people who are selling things, chocolates and honey and all these different things. And I remembered Santa Barbara had that because I used to come up to Santa Barbara a lot. So we walked that, went to the park, uh, kids, we all played at the park. It was just beautiful. And then from Santa Barbara, the plan was, I have some meetings and interviews in LA this week. So the plan was to stop halfway, which would be Malibu, go to the ranch, and visit the Randalls. I wanted to visit Holly. I wanted to visit Sue's. I wanted to see how everybody was doing. It had been a while since I'd been able to get back there and got to drive down from Santa Barbara uh, to Malibu, which I have to say. Now, I've been told that California has had like 45 inches of rain. I don't know if that's in the last year, in the last two years, but I can tell you something. Of all the years I lived in California and all the time I spent traveling all around California, I have never seen it so green. It's like Florida green. It's like Pennsylvania, New Jersey green. Like when you get out of the city and you get on the Jersey Turnpike and it's just summer and it's just so vibrant and so green. It is like that. Wildflowers everywhere. I could not. My plan was when I got in the Uber from Santa Barbara to Malibu, because I didn't want to drive because I was going to use that hour and a half to work. So I was like, okay, get an Uber, sit in the back. You have a list of people that you need to correspond with. So I sat in the back of the car and within the first five minutes on the freeway, I was like, oh, well, there's no way I could work. I've never seen California like this. It's so pretty. And I'm glad I did that because it reminded me of so many things. Again, the aha moment that I took notes that I wrote down that I'll share in more detail. But it reminded me of how much time I spent in California, how much driving I did, how many places I went. You know, there was a time in the late 90s where it was like 1997, where the Spearmint Rhino had locations in LA, in Oxnard, in Santa Barbara, in Santa Clara, uh, a city of industry, of all the res- all these different places. And so I would do these clubs so often it had me driving. And when I was driving from Santa Barbara to Malibu, I knew everything that was coming up next. I remembered the outlets. I remembered the movie theater. I remembered the gas station we would stop at. I remembered where we would eat. And each time I'd be going a little bit further, I'd be like, if I'm right, over here on the left is going to be that Italian restaurant I liked. And I would stop at when I was going to the Oxnard Club. And then there it was on the right. I was just in such awe, not just the green and how beautiful the wildflowers were, but just how lucky I am that I've traveled so much that I have such a great absorption rate of understanding what's around me. I have a really good sense of direction. I have a really good recall. So if I am seeing something, I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that's by that gas station. I remember that's by that thing. So it was just exciting and it was just fun to... uh drive and look around and think about how excited I was when I moved here, how hard it was to leave California, how much I missed the weather, uh, all of those little things. But don't worry, once I got out of Malibu and started to head towards LA and I sat in traffic, I was like, oh, okay, I remember now. But I took the drive, got up the ranch, spent the afternoon. I get there. Susan and Holly are at the table and Holly already has charcuterie board and snacks and all of this stuff. And I had brought some chocolate covered mango that I bought in Santa Barbara at the beach because Brittany had told me how amazing this is and I would love it. And when she was explaining it to me, she's like, there's this woman, she has chocolate covered mango. It is so good. And I said to her, you know, it would be even better if there was like sea salt on it. And she's like, how did you know there is sea salt on it? In my mind, in my like mind of like sweets and sweet and salty and all the different things. I was like already going there. So it was just funny. I said, perfect. Cause I'll buy some because I wanted to show up with something. It's nice when you're visiting people, if you show up with something, so I wouldn't show up with something. So I was able to show up with that and they loved it. It was great. 
And I just spent the day just like catching up with Holly, got to see her daughter, got to see her husband, got to be around the ranch, got to catch up with Suze and just really touch base with this life that is such a part of my life. But now that I live cross country, though we text and maybe we'll email or get on a call, like it's not the same as sitting at someone's dining room table and just talking, just catching up, just going through all of the different things. So that was a great time. And then I took an Uber uh, down to LA to check into my hotel and the games had just started. And I was like, all right, I'm going to take the evening to myself. I'm going to have a glass of wine and order a French fries and watch these games and just relax, which I've been doing. And now I'm getting ready to gear up for these meetings. I'm getting ready to gear up for our next round of recording new episodes of Better Haves on Sirius XM. If you are a listener in your car or a device, it's Raw Comedy Channel 99. If you use the app like I do, you just search Better Haves and you'll find the show. You'll be able to see the library. We had another great episode last week and new episodes release every Friday on Raw Comedy Channel 99 at 10 a.m., 5 p.m., and 10 p.m. Eastern time. I love those times because you get morning drive on the West Coast, you get afternoon drive on the East Coast, and then evening drive on the West Coast. So it just kind of works out really well. And then they replay. So a lot of like really exciting things going on. We also know the NFL draft is around the corner and I will be at Sapphire 39. I am asking my fans to please wear your team jersey because I plan to bebop around and sit with you Once a pick is made and ask you, my friend, how do you feel this affects your team? Will this make you think differently of your wide receivers, of your quarterback, your your record? What do you think? Because that's a great night to start looking at team totals and placing some early, early bets. Uh, So I'll be doing that for, for the draft, which is Thursday, April 25th. And then we know my birthday is around the corner. And right now we've got one special night planned so far in New York City, and that's going to be Saturday, May 4th at Harbor Nightclub. Cannot wait. I'm gathering my people. We had such a good time the last couple of years I've been there. Uh, And it's funny because when I go there for my birthday, I feel like it's my birthday. My friends are here. People get tables around me that I know. and I get to really visit. But as I'm there, I'm thinking to myself, like, Man, I remember when I loved doing nightclubs like this, but geez, now I don't love it as much. You wait for the bathroom and all these things. Like that's when I realize I'm old, but I still enjoy every minute of it and know that I get just that taste. And then halfway through the night, I'll be like, you know, why don't I do this more often? And then the next day when I wake up, because that place is open till like five, six in the morning, I will be reminded of why I don't do it more often. I have a conversation to share with you today of somebody who has created such a unique path in life. And I'm glad that our paths have crossed. That is my guest today, Crystal Erin Yanni. Enjoy this conversation and make sure you give Crystal a follow. Today, I'm going to take you on a wild ride that started through many countries and journeys, publishing seven plus books, mentoring women and going around the world to discover the connection, yoga, healing, tantra. This is going to be a fabulous conversation with a bit of a twist, but we're going to save the twist. I'm sitting here today with Crystal Ariani, and you can follow Crystal Ariani on all platforms and IG, YouTube. Crystal, thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. <laughs> Crystal, let's start first with publishing that large of a series of books and your and your background in writing. Did you have a background in writing before you started this publishing journey? So I've always been a writer, just writing on my own, and I didn't really have the confidence when I was younger to share it. But actually, when I went into university, which was for wildlife biology, something totally different, my English teacher was so impressed by my writing. She really encouraged me. She asked me to be the editor of the school newspaper and was surprised that that wasn't my major. So I didn't end up pursuing my entire degree, but just the fact that I received that encouragement in my writing was worth what I paid for the first two years of tuition. (laughs) And then I started sharing from there. (laughs) And to think that, as I mentioned, you also being a mentor, a renowned mentor to women, 
your English teacher having that conversation with you made a difference in your life. And it's funny that as we get older, we remember these instances that maybe to that person, that teacher who maybe picked five students a year that felt really strongly to inspire and motivate them, changed the direction of our lives. Mm -hmm. And they come up in our stories. And then you decided to do that same thing with your work is inspire others. Mm, yeah. And it's like this ripple effect wave of yeah, inspiring others too. So. so you already gave away where you're from when you said university. That means you're Canadian. Okay. Yes. You know, we, we, we know this here. From a small town in Canada, where were you born and raised? So I've had a nomadic lifestyle pretty much since, since I was young, but I grew up around Vancouver and then moved more northern small town Canada. Tell me, how small town? My grandmother's from <laughs> Saska Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Oh, yeah. That's a pretty random spot. Small town. Uh, yeah. yeah, we were we moved around quite a bit. I went to 10 different schools. So some of the towns had like 1,000 people, and then a couple of them had around like 80,000. So. And at 18 years old, after university, you decided that you were going to take yourself with a one-way ticket and go to China. So I was actually, based on where I grew up, you're kind of as a woman just told exactly what you're going to do with your life. Like you're going to marry it. up in Northern Canada. Most of the men work on the oil rigs if they make like six figures right out of high school. So um, they work on the oil rigs up there. And basically as a girl, you're told to just marry someone who, who has a good position on the oil rigs and have his babies. And that's your life. Um, <laughs> for me, I was like, and I was going, I was following that path. I was engaged to be married out of high school. He was trying to get me wow. pregnant. Um, and it became very abusive. He was really abusive mm. to me. I was actually in and out of hospitals um, at a women's shelter at one point. And as we were planning the wedding, I was getting like physically sick. My body was rejecting the entire thing. And I was financially relying on him for everything. I didn't really have many resources where I was. So I ended up yeah, taking a one-way ticket to China as far as I could get from him and my life in Canada with no money, uh, no idea what to expect. But I was like, whatever is waiting for me there is going to be better than the life I'm leaving behind. So um, I ended up living in Asia for six years from there and traveling to 70 countries in my 20s. So that was the start of a big, yeah, a new life for me, really. <laughs> What was that like for your family, for you being so incredibly far and them not really knowing any way to, you know, go, you're, you're, you're on, you're on the move. What was that like for them? Mm. Yeah. My mother and I actually just had a discussion about it this the other day that I was like, were you scared when I first left? Cause no one in my family ever left, has ever left Canada. Um, and she was like, you told me back then, I don't remember telling her this, that like, I was going to lose my life if I stay in Canada. Like that's how drastic it was. So even though she like was not totally supportive of it, she knew that I needed to do this. It was something no matter what that I had to do. And my parents watched the news. So they based like all their judgments of countries on what they've learned on the news. And then I'm there like taking stories and pictures. I'm like, see, it's nothing like what you, you know, places are so different than what we learned, like being in Northern Canada. <laughs> How did you survive for those 10 years traveling through all of those countries? Were you teaching yoga? Were you teaching English? How were you surviving? So I started modeling and, you know, I went there with an agency, like signing with one and I didn't know if they were legit or not. I didn't know if I was getting like sold into, you know, the sex trade or something. <laughs> it was pretty sketchy, the whole thing. Um, yeah. So I started modeling. I also started stripping for a bit, um, which paid my way through university at the time. And then I started teaching yoga and then I began teaching women's retreats and that's mostly what I'm doing now, retreats, workshops around the world. I was teaching at a lot of festivals for a while. Um, yeah. And now how I did you online. like, how did you find yourself in that space in other countries? Um, you have multiple languages. I'm assuming at this point you had to speak enough to get by everywhere you were staying. Interestingly enough, I thought I would learn all of these different languages. Everyone's so excited to speak English with me. <laughs> so I know how to say thank you. That's the main one. I'm like, as long as I know thank you in pretty much every language, that's you need to know that one. Um, yeah, I never learned 
fluently any other languages, which would surprise me, but English is like the... And what was it like in this space at that time for women's retreats? Because I think we were just probably coming on to this notion that women could get together in groups and meet Mm -hmm. other women and network with each other and bond with each other. Because you mentioned earlier how when you were growing up, women were kind of like, this is going to be your life. I think there was a time where we also were told women didn't get along with each other and couldn't Mm -hmm. inspire each other. Yeah, it's actually been such a pleasure for me traveling the world during this, if you want to call it a global awakening of consciousness. There's been conscious communities popping up everywhere and little festivals around like yoga and conscious living and sustainable living and sisterhood as well. So when I first started traveling, I was like an alien to everyone. I was talking about like being vegan and people thought that was like a cult. I was vegan and, you know, teaching yoga and they just thought I was like this extremist. And now it's just normal. It's like a regular dialogue. So it's been really like fun to see the communities and, you know, these different paths popping up more all over the world, really. Yeah. I mean, that's so real though, even on TV shows. (laughs) 15 years ago, they would joke about the one vegan, like, oh, that person, you know what I mean? And yoga is so healing. I'm not sure if you've watched the Blue Zone documentaries on Netflix about Blue Zones are the people, places in the world where people can live to be over 100. Mm -hmm. And one of the factors that keeps people alive is balance. And when I realize that how imbalanced people are and not balance in your life, balance in your core, being able to hold yourself up. In America, more people die. And I hate to laugh about this, but we're the only country where people die from falling. Mm. Whereas in countries where like they talk a lot about Sardinia and we go to Sardinia, there's these stiff little streets and steep hills that they're walking every day, getting their groceries, doing their thing. And they're actually very agile. They garden a lot. And so getting up and down gardening helps their core, helps with balance. Yoga is such an important vehicle in so many cultures in America, it's a thing, but in other cultures, it's part of life. Do you find Mm. it's more valuable in other countries, health and wellness than you see here in the United States? Yeah. Well, I spent a lot of time in the East, so around India and Asia, and of course they have a deeper connection to their spiritual roots than over here. And just being off balance, it's really losing harmony. I feel that because we've lost this internal spiritual connection, it's projected and it's manifested in our external reality as well. So when we we don't have that internal balance or connection to our own spirit and a healthy relationship with ourselves, then it really manifests in our external as well. And I think that's what you see more over here. Um, I love Eastern philosophy and just their way of living it's a lot more focused on spirit. And for me, growing up in Canada and then coming to America, um, I feel that, I mean, there's pros and cons to every place, but when you're in Asia, for example, when you see even homeless people, you see this like different spark in their eyes (laughs) than you see over here. I mean, especially now I'm in LA, so I noticed the difference. So when I was growing up, I was really chasing like material success, our definition in North America of success. And then when I started traveling more East, I realized, started seeing what success is in a different way. Oh, it's so different. It's community. It's, it's Mm -hmm. having large meals. It's knowing that you're going to see your friend for coffee. Like Mm -hmm. it is a totally different thought process. And also you're talking about the East the way the understanding of the herbs and the things that they grow and how they Mm -hmm. live and things that are important and essential in their diets. And it could be a unique vegetable that we don't have here or, but they really will make their life and every meal they have around circle around, look at tofu Mm -hmm. in other countries, how it's just such a normal balanced part of their meal. And here Mm -hmm. it became a thing when we all became vegans. Yeah. (laughs) Right? And tofu is like the greatest ingredient to thicken a tomato soup or something when Mm -hmm. you don't want to use dairy. So like you learn all these things, but it must have been fascinating to see that that fresh, great food, the way they eat, the smaller portions and just tea time, community time, the building, the faith, and then the way their life is a bit more relaxing than ours because they're not 
working till nine, 10 o'clock at night, uh, like we do here. So I just think the pace of life allows them to tap into that spiritual side because they're not as constantly stressed and constantly rushing. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Terrence McKenna's work at all, but he predicted that at this time we would be going through this archaic revival. And we see it here in North America as like a new age way of living and, you know, this new age spirituality and stuff. But really, it's actually just coming back to our roots, learning how to live in harmony with nature, sustainable living, gardening, uh, coming back to more spiritual practices to the earth, uh, coming back in tribes, sisterhood and tribes, which is a lot of the festivals and gatherings and, you know, sister circles that we see now. And it's seen as like new age, but it's really actually us coming back to what worked really well for us. And I think with the last few years of what's been happening on our planet with since the pandemic and everything really coming to surface, I feel like that's triggered a lot. And we're coming back into our old ways that worked may have worked better for us. <laughs> What advice do you give someone, you meet a new woman that you're going to start mentoring, maybe bringing her into a group setting. How do you start the conversation when somebody just wants to achieve a greater feeling, a connection with themselves, uh, maybe want to practice yoga, have more connections with their relationships, family, friends, what have you? Where do you start peeling off the layers to help people tap in? So I usually start with a daily sadhana, which is a daily spiritual practice to commit to. Um, also for the path that I follow and teach is Tantra, traditional Tantra. There's a lot of misconceptions in America what Tantra is. It's become really based around sex here, but it's actually a really profound spiritual path of accepting and celebrating all parts of our humanness as divine. So that's where it's different from some other paths that kind of renounces everything in this worldly life. So I start with a lot of really releasing shame and shadow work of accepting yourself fully. That's where usually where I start because shame is like an epidemic on our planet. Um, shaming our desires, our emotions, our humanness, right? Yeah. I mean, there's shame in everything. There's people that can <laughs> shame you for having money. There's people yeah. that would shame you for, you know, whatever it is, because maybe their understanding is that's an interesting start. And it makes perfect sense because it could even be shame as somebody didn't take care of their health. And now mm -hmm. they're mad at themselves because they didn't take care of themselves as well as they could have. Like that is the first absolute layer. Mm -hmm. You're now in one place. You're not traveling the world currently. I'm sure you do, still do travel a bit. You said you're in California now. You're in LA? Yeah, I'm here for another couple months and then I think of moving to Mexico actually. <laughs> okay. LA is not a centered spiritual place. Uh, the weather mm -hmm. is the best. The sunsets are the best. There's so many great nature places to go and, and be connected, but it's definitely a different energy of people. Do you agree? Yes. And I was just in Hollywood. Now I'm in Topanga, which is much more spiritual feeling. <laughs> I'm like, my backdrop right now is this beautiful forest. So it's much more my vibe. But Hollywood, I was like, okay, I'm in the belly of the beast here. And it's a great test to my practices and my own, like, can I keep my nervous system and still stay centered in this environment? Um, I wouldn't prefer to do it long term, though. <laughs> But LA is interesting because I have found little pockets of spiritual communities. It takes a little time to like feel them out and, you know, see which ones resonate. But LA does have a lot to offer in that way. But yeah, it's like when you're in India, it's so hectic and chaotic all the time. If you're in, say, one of the cities or where there's lots of people and it's a test to your yoga and to your meditation, if you can really still find that centeredness when there's all this noise and energy around you. So, Yeah, that makes perfect sense. A ton of chaos, right? You've mm -hmm. still got to pull it in. And so you're in LA, you, you, uh, smart to where Topanga is like nature. You got the nice mountains around you. There's so many great places in the Canyon to go for walks. You can go right over and go to Malibu, mm -hmm. but you've decided to take your studies in a direction with human interaction by putting yourself into the industry to do yet another layer study on our connections. So 
need to know your stage <laughs> name, how long and how you got in the industry and what this experience has been like for you. So Venus Valencia was birthed about six months ago. <laughs> Great name, by the way. Great name. Okay. I, like I wanted want just God as Venus, but my agent said we need it. We need a last name too. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's been really interesting. As I mentioned before, I was a stripper in my early 20s for a two, about two years in different countries. And the overall experience was very empowering for me coming out of an abusive relationship. I was like a little beaten dog after that relationship. I learned how to communicate my boundaries, how to be an empowered woman, because if you're going to be in that environment, you can either, you know, let it break you or you can be really in your power and like stand your ground, which I learned to do. So overall, it was a great experience. Um, it funded some of my travels. And then I went into teaching for seven years. And last year I had... Um, what I call tower card moment. I don't know if you know tarot, but it's like tower card is when everything just falls apart. Um, last year I was visiting Canada and I fell in love. I did the thing that I said I'd never do and fell in love with a small town Canadian man. I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, this is so ironic of all the fucking places I've traveled. I end up like obsessed with this man from small town, Northern Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and within six months of falling in love, I was pregnant and I was like planning my life. I'm like, I'm really doing like the thing I said I'd never do. I'm totally ready to just settle down in small town Canada. And then I ended up having a miscarriage. And two months oh. later, the father died and he was in a car accident. And I had to step away from my career because I just couldn't hold space for women. Like I needed someone to hold space for me. And I was alone in the mountains. Like I had no, oh. no support system. Um, yeah, there's a lot to be said about that phase of my life. But for a sure. few- What a turn of events. And these are yeah. the turn of events in life that so powerful, so dynamic. As the dynamic life that you lived younger, traveling all these countries, there's this yin and this yang, right? And mm. no, obviously you had to pull away because you need to recharge your own spirit. But what a turn of events and what a, a lot to be processing, this high arc of feeling this emotion of like, wow, I'm going to do this. And, the, and then the loss and then another loss. And then again, mm -hmm. wondering why would I stay in Canada? Now you go back to that same question. Like, why does this bring trauma when I come here? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you were asking yourself, what is my connection with here and not being supposed to be here? Yeah, definitely. I've asked myself a lot and meditated on it a lot. Like I have the most, I don't bizarre, traumatic, relationship with the land that I'm from <laughs> like, um whenever I go back something like create, just wild happens so um yeah so I took a few months stepped away announced that I was taking a sabbatical last summer and refunded a bunch of my one-on-one -on -one clients like it was very scary for me but I just really had to honor how I was feeling at the time I didn't even know if I was going to go back to my regular career I was like I don't know you know I felt like a very big part of me died with him and with the baby like that was the whole life i was planning and just i was so attached to him too that it really felt like a big part of me died and i kind of had a identity loss for a while um so i was in the mountains of canada and i was like okay i need to make income but i'm not ready to my some of my online programs i'm holding space for like 50 to 100 women so i'm like i'm not ready for that it feels like a lot of pressure right now so i started only fans I was like, this is fun. I'm, you know, it's like no pressure. Um, it was doing sure, well. I mean, if you yeah. were having, if you were having a day where you felt like creating, you could create. If you were having an emotional day, you could just answer messages. Like mm -hmm. you had something to do to keep you busy enough, but it was really at your leisure and allowing you to make an income without being so under the pressure of other people relying mm -hmm. on you or being, it's a freedom thing, right? And, it, and it, the access, the ease, and it's the beautiful part about the platform that it gives that opportunity and allows that space for, hey, I'm going to come on here and do this when I want to for now and then grow it and see how I feel about it. Yeah, exactly. And I, 
I mean, I shared a little bit of what I was going through. I didn't share all the details at the time, but even my fans on there were just so supportive and like checking in on me. And I just felt so loved up. I'm like, okay, this is fun. And I was enjoying it. And when I announced it on my Instagram, I lost like over 10,000 uh, followers within the first few days. And I was receiving, I also did Playboy and people were not happy about Playboy. So I was receiving like death threats and just enraged women in my community. And I knew that I would get some haters, but I didn't realize to this degree because basically people have created this idea of me and put me in this box as a spiritual teacher. Maybe they read my books, maybe they watch my YouTube videos and they've created this idea that I'm like this wholesome, you know, I used to say that I'm like secretly a bad bitch because when I was doing yoga, it was just like, I was only sharing that side of me online. And then I gradually started sharing more and more. So I think I understand people were surprised because they didn't see me that way. But in my perspective, you know, our sexuality is sacred and I didn't see it not aligning with my message in any way, but a lot of people did. So this kind of triggered this like inner rebel in me that's like, okay, if you guys don't like this, like, what are you going to say when I go to LA and do porn? Like, <laughs> But also it triggered like this protectress of the women in the industry just remembering like the shame and how I had to hide it when I was a stripper and I realized that I wanted to use my platform to shine a light on the industry my experience in it and share my perspective so that's been my journey recently and it's actually been received really well I feel like when I announced the playboy and OnlyFans it kind of filtered out a lot of the really angry people and then when I started sharing my transition into films in LA, people have been pretty receptive and encouraging about it, which was surprising to me. <laughs> it's been a journey. The thing is like, it's fine if you want to unfollow somebody because you no longer agree with their message. I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. I'm not fine with people continuing to talk about mental health awareness, mm -hmm. talk about anti-bullying, because a lot of the same people that put out these comments have these things in their profile, but yet still add to the atmosphere, that vibration. Mm -hmm. If you don't like, we were just taught growing up, if you don't like somebody, you just don't spend time with them. You don't talk about them behind their back. You just don't say anything. And we've also were told if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. But when people turn on you that way, it's very still hurtful because some of them mattered in a sense that you were like, wow, okay, it's fine. You don't want to follow me. But to say, awful things to try and break me down as a person, to try and make this one thing erase all of the years of work I've put in and all the things that I've already done and the countries that I've traveled and the things that I've created. And it's common. It's just so flippant how people are. And when people leave comments, it'll probably be something and I don't respond back. I just either mm -hmm. put them, either block them or delete their message would have you. But I just always comment back in my mind, like, you know, what you're saying to me right now is actually worse because you're following me, you're hate following me, and you're waiting for posts to make nasty comments. Like, what world do you live in that, that makes you feel good? And even though people will say you're hiding behind a keyboard, nobody knows who you are, you know what? Your energy knows who you are. That mm -hmm. karma that surrounds you knows who you are. You are putting that frequency out there and it is being felt. You are not anonymous. You are adding to the cesspool that we don't need and breaking people down at their worst moments. So I'm sorry that you had to see that side, but then I like how you flipped it already and realized, huh, filtered out the unnecessary but there's mm. nothing worse than your safety being violated and people threatening you. It is a horrible feeling. They'll dox you. They'll find you online. Like they'll go to your family. Like they're relentless. Mm. They put more work into it than you put into doing anything that could possibly offend them. Yeah. And I often wonder, I'm like, who are these people at home? Do, like, do I know people that do this? Like, are, <laughs> who are these people? And then I imagine, like, would you come up to me? Like, say, if you saw me at a restaurant, would you come up to me and say that to me? Like, that's what I imagine. I'm like, imagine you just came up and was like, Crystal, how are you doing this with your body? Like, you deserve to die. Like, no one's saying that in person. Why would you be okay saying it over a computer to a stranger on the internet? You know, it's wild. As someone, Crystal, who's really 
receptive to vibrations, the spiritual connection you feel with people. What has it been like for you going on to set in LA? Because, you know, you win some, you lose some. Sometimes you get really <laughs> good energy on set. Sometimes you get somebody that's having a bad day. It's just like any other job. People can come to work not feeling their best, but it's a different work because you are being intimate when somebody is having that bad day. It's never an easy day. Yeah. I have my stage here. <laughs> When I started, I'm like, I wonder if I can like sage my, you know, co-stars. Like, will they think that's weird? <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do that. But I can protect myself. I do meditations before and after just protecting my energetic field. Um, and I also was curious. So there's like this ancient tantric practice where they used to, it's kind of like out there, but I'm a bit out there, <laughs> where they used to have sex with people that they found really unattractive or that were parts of different, like India has a lot of hierarchy, like, you know, different um, social, like they had the untouchables before, which were like, you don't associate with them basically. So they would actually have sex with like people that they weren't genuinely attracted to as a spiritual practice of seeing the divine in this person and becoming attracted to them and loving them. So when I started porn, I'm like, I wonder if I can practice this and just see every person that I connect with as God, as the divine, and also protect my own energy. And I can't say that I've really had any negative experiences. Um, I'm pretty aware of my energy. So I meditate after every day I'm on set. And I, you know, if, if I felt like it was off, I would take a break probably, but it's been pretty good. I wish like the main thing that I don't like with the industry is that we can't pick who our partners are. Like, I think I would stay in it for a while if we could, but it's fun when you get the same person a few times and then there's been, you know, that connection established. So, you know, you actually can pick. It's just they don't want you to because it makes their life more complicated. But mm. for years, I always picked. Really? And when I was producing my own movies, I would ask my talent, hey, who are your top five favorite? Let me see if I can get one of your top five. So at least I'm giving you somebody. I just wanted real passion in the scene. I didn't really like it when people met for their first time on set. And I mm. wanted there to be a reason why somebody really wanted to work with somebody. Mm. So I felt that was very special special. The internet came and the agents decided we don't want to make it more difficult for the producers. So we're just going to stop giving everybody a choice. Mm -hmm. And I tell everyone in the industry, no, make your top 10 list. And when people book you say, Hey, these are, can I email you my top 10 list? Because also to protect your health mm -hmm. and your spirit, there's going to be people you meet that you just don't vibrate and you mm -hmm. want to just not have them on your no list and have them be offended. You just mm -hmm. want to. So I think that's an important thing to be aware of and to know that you're hot, you're in the business, you can choose. Yeah, that's good to know. That's good to know. And of course, the viewers can feel the difference, you know, if you're really into it or if not so much. So it's win-win it's for everyone, I think. <laughs> so Crystal, what can everyone find on your YouTube channel? I know you're very active there. And where can everyone find your books? So my books, the best spot is Amazon, just under Crystal Arignani. And then YouTube, Crystal Arignani again. Uh, on my YouTube, I'm sharing... I share a lot of my personal experiences openly, uh, just like I'm talking to a friend. Uh, and then I also share Kundalini videos, meditation, um, just chats on self-growth and spirituality. So. I love it. Everyone's going to want to subscribe <laughs> because that's good stuff we all need to be doing. And I've just gotten more into yoga uh, this past year where I'm doing it a couple of times a week now. And I really love it. It's my nighttime workout after I've worked out in the morning, but it's like the greatest. And then I go and sit in the sauna and it's just been a really good addition to my energy, my, 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 my just, it's great. I love it. Mm, it becomes addicting really. <laughs> It does become, and I could see how hot yoga would become even more addicting, mm -hmm. uh, all of those things. But it was such a pleasure sitting here with you today. I enjoyed this conversation. I'm going to add your books to my summer reading list, mm -hmm. and I'll make sure I make sure everyone follows you, and I'm wishing you nothing but the best in your journey in the industry. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been great chatting. <laughs>
I am feeling that love right there. Crystal was such a great conversation and really a unique story. I admire people who pick up their life and travel all through other countries because I know that they don't have a ton of wardrobe changes. They're not a lot of, a lot, a lot of, you know, suitcases. You're living very simply and you get to really break down the basics and really dive into those communities and cultures and learn about their foods and their herbs and, and their, and their practices. And so it was fascinating to me to know that, that she did that. And now the path that she's on with us here. So great conversation. Make sure you give her a follow. We know that you're all going to be coming to this city this summer and you're all going to want some really good Italian food. So you're going to go and you're going to want to pair it with the Norello Masculase. That's right. My red is available for you at Ombra. You can now pair my wines, Lisa by Lisa Ann, with your favorite Italian food, which comes right here from Ombra NYC. Check it out. Have a glass of my red Marella Masculis by White Grillo and enjoy all of the best food right here at Ombra. moment you've been waiting for, of course, is the mailbag. And I have pulled it together. It's a little bit different. You know, again, on the road, remote, we'll make it up for you, but did not want to miss giving you a little, little, little bit of all of this. Uh, mailbag is right here. Do you want to get involved? Do you have a question for me? Ask Lisa Ann at gmail.com. And here we are, our first question. And this is a good one. Have you ever considered running for political office? People ask me this a lot, and it's not just because of the Sarah Palin thing. You know, I do have my views. I do believe. I do sometimes think, how can we make change? So many people get into politics with good intentions. And then they are faced with the bureaucracy. Then they are faced with all the challenges. Then they are faced with who do we trust? Who do we not trust? The more I learn about how government operates in not just our country, in other countries, uh, the more I learn about the basics, you know, uh, who's making money off of pharmaceuticals, who's changing these laws and for what reasons, why are we not educating uh, things that we're changing in schools, you know, are we adding in some things but taking away other things that are very important. And I think that frustration would probably get the best of me. I think I would want to do as good as possible, but would be so limited. So with that said, there's other ways that I can get involved by doing good things. I can get involved with things in my community and I can do things like helping out with charity work, helping out with volunteer time. So I do know if I do want to flex that, there's a way to do it. But it is interesting because I was the president of my HOA in California for two years. So that is a political office. So I guess I should say I have already run for president of the HOA and succeeded. Next question. This is a funny one. Exotica joke from Roller Coaster Rider. I know exactly who you are from the, both the emails that you sent. There was something I wanted to say to you at Exotica, but I didn't. So here it is. I gave you a five dollar. I wanted to give you a five dollar tip and say this is for the Lisa and Bail Bond Fund. Maybe it was good. I didn't say this to you directly. Take care. Stay safe and keep being awesome. So this person thought they were going to troll me which is funny, with the bail funds, $5 to the bail fund. But this is a great reminder. And I had so many conversations about that in Chicago at Exotica. Smart people don't ask me about it because they listened to my podcast. They followed through on the understanding of the conversation I had about it for the next two weeks. Uh, and the other people still truly believe I was arrested. The fact that the news networks never fact-checked whether I was arrested or not and took something that I had put on social media as 
let's just go down this rabbit hole and added layers to it. Remember, some of the articles said I was arrested for assaulting a police officer. Some of the articles said I was arrested for resisting arrest. Some of the articles, I was never arrested. And the fact that now this has really taught me something about people. It's a complete divide. There's people who are curious enough to know the truth and will put the time and effort into trying to uncover what that truth may be. Example, if I read an article quite often, I will go and read two or three more articles on the same topic and then kind of say, okay, who's leaving out this? What's important here? Who's telling the truth? And what is the closest to the truth that I can perceive from the research that I've done? Because I'm hella curious. But there's half the world that is not curious. And this is where we're having a problem leading to the first question with politics. I think it's harder than ever to lead because most people are just not paying attention. And most people want to feel that they know everything by gathering tiny little bits of information. So they know a lot of nothing. And other people who are more deliberate about gathering that data and forming their opinion are less likely to be flippant, crack jokes, and say silly things. Is it an education standard? Is it a curiosity factor? I can't figure it out, but I think I really started to sense it during the pandemic, where there were the people that were just watching the news eight hours a day or just getting fed information and just and just on this vicious cycle. And I think that really started this switch where people stopped following up. So many people send me mailbag emails and then they write me 20 more emails asking me why I haven't answered their question, but I have. I did it on my podcast. And there, I get it. There's so many podcasts out there. But I also think there's a lot of people that are paying attention to nothing and that are just watching TV or just whatever they're doing on social media and just reading and thinking 142 characters tells the story. So it would have been funny if he gave me the $5 for the bail bonds funds because I would have been able to in person ask him, so what is your perception of what went down that evening? at Radio City. I'd be curious to know. But pay attention, people. Don't get bamboozled. Don't be that person. I tested the world and half of the world failed. Last question right here is from my friend Jeff, who says, sports betting slash GFS. Is there a player who is dead to you and you won't bet because you've been burned over and over and over? Mine, Jeff says, is Anthony Davis. Funny, we're friends. And we have so much in common. And this, Jeff, is another thing that we have in common. One of the very, I've only played season-long fantasy basketball for about five years. And only in that five years did I get one season where I had a draft pick in the first three. You know, so I could be, I was picking a thing second. And who did I take? Anthony Davis. And what happened to Anthony Davis? He got hurt like the second week. He had no trade value. I kept him on my IR spot and he held up my IR spot almost the whole season. And I never got over it. I never got over it. So I am right there with you, my friend, Jeff. Everybody, if you're coming to New York City, you can get Lisa by Lisa Ann at Ambra and enjoy the environment and beautiful Italian food. You can also go to all three locations of Sapphire, 39th Street, 60th Street, and Times Square. You can also head yourself to Bill's Supper Club on 54th. Uh, Papa's, say less. Go to Lisa by Lisa and on Instagram and follow all. I thank you all for being here with me. I apologize again if the quality is not what we're used to. I kept this monologue and mailbag short knowing that my interview was collected before this trip because, of course, I knew I was taking this secret getaway. I just didn't tell you, and I love to roll this way. I will get you all details in next week's episode. Thank you so much for being here. Follow me on all platforms at The Real Lisa Ann, and I will see you this Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern for a YouTube live premiere. I will be in the chat. I promise you this Friday. I will see you there in the chat. Thank you for listening to an all-new episode of The Lisa Ann Experience. Thank you.